Good morning, everybody. It's Friday, January 13th. Uh, grain market's a little bit higher this morning. It's 5.29 a.m. Central as I speak here. Brian Split, good morning. Good morning, Joe. We got a three-day weekend coming up. You got big plans? Uh, just kids sports, which is great. That's what I love doing on the weekends. We're going to uh, boxing tonight. They've got some uh, professional boxing outside of Nashville. And my son, uh, Jimmy, he's seven. He got really into boxing after we watched Rocky a couple months ago. Okay. And uh, he wanted like a heavy bag for Christmas. And he's like goes and hits it in the garage so we're gonna go see some boxing tonight um i want to do like you know mostly on on the podcast and youtube i talk about the headlines and stuff we're gonna do the usda report like almost exclusively today because there was there's just so much to unpack here uh in regard to what they said you want to start off with the corn production numbers yeah we'll look at corn production um i think the the trade really had uh, the right idea coming into the report saying hey november they raised yield typically they'll do that in january uh, but there was one piece of the production that was a big miss, and I'm sure you'll show that. Yeah, so generally what happened here, guys, is that USDA lowered their harvested acreage number, not planted acreage, harvested acreage. And I don't have a great map of this, but where you saw the, the big declines in harvested acreage versus the previous reports were in places like Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota. Kansas had a decline of 710,000 harvested acres uh, versus the November report. Um, Nebraska was down 480,000. Um, South Dakota down 240,000. I think the general idea is that in those areas where you had the drought real bad, you had fail, what they call failed acres, essentially, like acres that were chopped for silage. They were counted counted as planted acreage acres, but they were not counted as harvested acres. And, and usually, Usually the trade has this stuff dialed in and USDA has it dialed in by October, November, but they kind of tricked us this time around with this big cut this late in the ball game, I guess. Yeah. I think if you asked a producer in any of those growing regions, when that was chopped, uh, it was months and months and months ago. So for right. that to uh, just be ignored and then come out on this report. And that was really the big surprise of the report for the corn balance sheet. If you ask me, I'm, Oh, it was definitely the big surprise. I'm not a big, like, USDA guy, put it that way. I don't take every little pit piece of information and analyze it. I've been to the data users meeting a couple of times, but my general understanding of it is that they get the FSA numbers like sometime in the fall, like in October, they get the certified stuff. They should have known what was failed like long before yesterday, I would think. So this is this is frustrating to me because it, it makes this stuff really difficult to figure out. I mean, I don't spend a whole lot of time trying to guess what USDA is going to do. And for the farmer, this ended up working out, of course, because the result was higher prices. I just I don't I don't like exactly how this like played out, though. I don't like that we're getting these adjustments so late in the ball game, And it seems like it happens so often. Yeah, you know, this report has so many working parts, and I think the trade did a good job of saying, hey, you know, corn for export need to address that feed residual. But possibly we should look at that. And they did. And then the industrial usage FSI, that was down 10 million bushels. So 185 million bushel reduction in demand. And I think the trade was really uh, in line with with what was going on there, uh, thinking yield should go up because it went up in November. And then you get a 1.6 million uh, acre reduction in harvested area. And that really changed the scope of the report uh, drastically. So when you get to the demand side, we'll start off with corn. Um, USDA did what people thought they were going to do, generally speaking, with that export cut. I think a lot of people think there might be more cuts to the export uh, deal down the road. I mean, this, this pace of, of sales and shipments is just not anywhere close to where it, it should be or could be. Correct. Uh, now, the inverse of that would be, boy, it has been so bad uh, that do we start running into some, some export sales? Does this report where everybody was expecting bearish and now the carryout is less than what we thought it was going to be does that start to spur some of the world buyers to buy and if it doesn't then that's a problem but this report should start to uh, to bring in some export business if that business is going to get done before spring i think some of that will hinge on um the forthcoming brazilian crop so they're going to plant this second corn crop which is their big export crop here over the next couple of months and depending on how weather and production prospects play out um, that could be a big deal when it comes to U.S. corn exports. You could see some some better sales. I mean, the, the best thing in the world would be if China came in and decided to start uh, buying corn. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but um, that would be one possibility, I suppose. Hey, this is a funny um, graphic that they include in the uh, executive briefing. 
they do industry expectations versus reality uh, when you come to corn production and it's like off the charts, like way below. I mean, nobody can predict this. To go back to the production thing. Nobody can predict this stuff. It's just it's uh, it's if you're an analyst and I guess maybe I'm an analyst. I don't know what I am, but this is this is frustrating to a lot of people. Uh, the trade also missed the soybean production number. Now, this wasn't as bad necessarily. So we were what down 70 million bushels from the prior report. Yeah, and I think most of that, again, just stems from the idea that a November yield increase should translate into a January yield increase. Instead, they dropped at 0.6, so a little bit of a surprise there. Uh, but they did drop uh, soybean exports, so that did uh, take a little bit of an edge off of that uh, production reduction. Yeah, I don't have as much of a gripe with USDA when it comes to the soybean production number. I mean, 70 million bushels is still a big chunk of change on the balance sheet, but to, to, to reduce harvested acreage by 300,000, that doesn't, that's not overly upsetting to me. The corn one is, is the one that bothers me a little bit. So we did end up below trend in regard to the soybean yield. 49 and a half was the, the final number. And who's to say that they couldn't even change that again at this point. But those, those two things, guys, I mean, the corn and soybean production numbers for the United States, uh, in my view, at least were probably the, the biggest surprises here. Uh, winter wheat seedings, larger than expected. Is that a surprise to you? I mean, I guess it's kind of a surprise to everybody. Uh, it was a number was bigger than what the trade was looking for. But I think if you look at the areas where we picked up acres aggressively, Illinois, Missouri, Indiana, Ohio, yeah. that really speaks to um, the idea that we had uh, better growing conditions than in, in the hard red. Uh, so the, the producer was willing to take advantage of that rally that we had into October. Uh, we had, uh, you know, wheat near the highs as we were drilling. And, and plus, we've been dealing with $14 beans uh, on and off again um, since August. So the idea that the producer could come in, lock in a very good price for winter wheat, and then plan to have beans behind it, I think that's what we really saw in the, in the SRW uh, growing regions. Yeah, the, the big pickup was in these SRW areas, your Illinois, your Indiana, your Ohio, places like that. Um, all winter wheat acreage was 36.95 million. The average trade guess was 34 and a half. Uh, we don't get a, a wheat balance, new crop wheat balance sheet till May. So like we know the acreage to some extent, but we don't really know what the rest of the balance sheet's going to look like. Um, so I guess it's kind of a wait and see deal. The market rallied on on that, which was actually like a bearish piece of information, really. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there was other parts of the report. They did show um, increased demand on uh, feed residual for wheat. So I think the USDA feels comfortable suggesting that we're going to feed more wheat uh, as they reduce the feed residual for corn. Uh, I think we can expect now because of this to see uh, the the relationship between hard red and soft red. We did have hard red um, lose a little bit of ground to soft red coming into the report. So I think they'll reload that and you'll see hard red gain on soft red after these numbers. When you look at South American production, um, trade wasn't too bad on this. USDA was actually a little bit more aggressive with their cut to this Argentina soybean production number than the trade had expected. But I think a lot of people would argue that this 45 and a half for Argentina soybeans is too high. I mean, we're seeing private estimates like sub 40, 37. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, any th any thoughts on Argentina? Is it is it too early to write off the crop? Like they they're just wrapping up planting in some areas. Is it too early? Or is is there we're definitely going to be below trend? It's definitely going to be bad. Just a question of how bad. I don't know. I'm not an agronomist, and I've never grown a crop in my life, so I can't really say. But it is early, um, and so you know all the things that you hear. Hey, if beans get planted in dry conditions and then they get rain later. I mean, that's exactly what the crop wants. I don't know. I think there's still room to uh, see this crop improve if we get conditions to improve. Um, but we also have seen previous years where these private estimates go way too far. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably what's happening right now. Oh, like the cool thing to do if you're uh, somebody who puts out these private estimates is to be like the first one to make the big cut right. and be like the low man on the totem pole with your, with your uh, production estimates, good or bad. Like you see that with good crops too. Um, the, the private groups will race to have the, the highest estimate, uh, nothing surprising for Brazil. Um, they increased the Brazilian soybean number, uh, Brazilian corn was actually cut a little bit. And, and that's what Conab said yesterday too. Um, I think maybe mainly because they have some drought in the South of Brazil, which is like kind of the same drought that that's impacting Argentina and places further South. And I think that number uh, could end up going back up, uh, but because of the safrina crop. So right, you Rio don't Grande know. Is, yeah, right. Rio Grande do Sol is is dry. That's what prompted them to to reduce the uh, Brazil corn. 
but you get a good growing uh, season for the safrina crop. That million tons can come back easily and, and maybe more than a million if, if they have good growing weather. Okay, guys. So big take home from the report yesterday. We'll wrap that portion up. I mean, the lower corn production number and, and the big cut to harvested acreage was the big surprise. I'd probably say in soybeans, the, the smaller crop from last year was the big surprise. Most of the demand stuff, kind of what we thought. Uh, the last thing I wanted to touch on is, is separate from this uh, CPI is declining, but as expected. So inflation was six and a half percent annualized on the consumer side in um, December. And that was down from what, 7.1 in November. Um, gas prices are actually down one and a half percent versus where they were a year ago, according to this report, accounting for a big chunk of the decline. Is inflation over? I think you're going to have certain markets that continue to battle with inflation that have more of their own story. Um, you know, I mean, commodities uh, trade individually. You've got growing seasons for agricultural commodities. So I think you're going to have certain markets that uh, will have fits and spurts. But um, overall, uh, I, I think you're seeing things slow down quite a bit. And I look at the money supply out there right now. And if you believe money supply is a big part of inflation, which I, I do, um, then uh, th that M2 money supply uh, constricting drastically uh, would be a, a continued concern for, uh, you know, for inflationary bulls. A lot of things are still up sharply versus where they were a year ago. Transportation's up 15%. Electricity's up 14%. Food at home's up 12%. Food away from home's up 8%. Shelter's up 8%. I, I would venture to say, though, like, I don't know that these items are rising anymore. It feels like they've risen. And now a lot of this stuff is leveled off. And that's all you need to see to see reduced or zero inflation is just see prices level off. Like to get back to, to a 2% inflation rate or a zero inflation rate, you don't need to see prices of these items go back to where they were in 2019. We just have to see the, the increases stop. Um, here's a chart for you. CPI and the Bloomberg Commodity Index. Uh, I think people think that I talk about CPI like just for fun, but commodities like directly impact the inflation numbers to a significant degree. They do. And so me being a chart guy, I look at that chart and I don't need to draw any lines. I would just say, wow, that looks like one of those descending triangles where you kind of have like some flat values in uh, late Q2 into uh, Q4 of 2022. You obviously have a downtrend from Q1 of 2022. And uh, um, generally that pattern would be a, uh, a negative pattern. So we'll see how it resolves itself, but I wouldn't be surprised to see that Bloomberg Commodity Index um, retrace a little bit more of that rally from 2020. The take home from this chart, guys, is that it is not a coincidence that commodities and inflation peaked like at the same time. Because when commodities peak, like the crude oil, gasoline in particular, I mean, that's a, a big contributor to the inflationary aspect. That was around the same time that the grain markets peaked. I mean, back last spring, or early summer, you just had the, the entire commodity complex as a whole uh, peaked back in, in the spring or summer of 22. And, and there are exceptions, not every market acted exactly the same way, but uh, they were all kind of similar to, to some extent, at least it was Russia, Ukraine rally after that. And then a lot of stuff kind of backed off. Correct. Um, and like I said, you've got certain markets, cattle, for example, that are still up near yeah. their highs. Um, so if a market has a story, they're going to trade that. But yeah, overall commodities have uh, definitely come down since that April, May, June timeframe. Uh, cattle market was a little bit lower yesterday um, ahead of the uh, cash open in the outside markets. We've got uh, US dollar a little bit higher. S&P's down 12, Dow Jones down 60, gold's up a few ticks. Uh, crude oil is up 58 cents at 78.97. Crude still looks like a bear market to me. Is this a bear market rally? I think uh, until proven otherwise. I think so. I, I, I still think that market wants to uh, kind of find the equilibrium that I, I see around 65. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see these bounces and then they sell into them and, and we eventually make some new lows again. But I don't know that you're going to see this thing just fall apart. All right. Hey, Brian, thanks for joining me early on Friday morning. Guys, the markets are closed Monday, so I will be back on Tuesday. Have a great weekend.